So we are back into looking at a simple data set. And we are going to use this simple data set to explain the three methods of assessing efficiency. Please remember, efficiency assessment, first you select your DMU. Second, you select your input and output. Third, you choose your efficiency type. Now look at this data carefully. This data is made up of one input and one output. Six DMUs. That is six decision-making units, DME one to six on the far left. The input are staff and sales. The input is staff and then the output is sales. So you can see that the DME one use one staff to produce one sales. DME seven, DME six, use seven staff to produce six sales, very lazy. Some people are lazy about that. Now, this is a data set. Let's catapult it. But before we catapult it, how do we assess efficiency in simple ratios? Those of you who do accounting, this is how you go about it. You measure the efficiency in a simple ratio format. This is one of the reasons why I don't like accounting or financial ratios, because it's a lot of competition of ratios. You'll come to see that very soon. So if you have to calculate the ratio for each, ratio is actually computed as the output over input. That's how we compute the ratios. So if you look at the first, last column on the ratio, one over one will give you one. Three over two will give you 1.5. Two over four will give you 0.5. Five over five will give you one, and then on and on. So using the ratios, you can detect that the higher the ratio, the more efficient that particular firm is. So in this case, which firm is the most efficient? DMU2. 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 DMU2, good. Now this is by using simple ratios. Let's look at the disadvantages of using the simple ratios. At first, let me tell you that ratios, even though there are some disadvantages, they are all right, they are fine. Okay. They, are, they are disadvantages. See, they are easy to compute. That one is cool. Easy to interpret. That one too is cool. But these are the problems. They are partial measures of performance, according to Smith in 1990. Ratios are partial. Very partial. Now, when we say they are partial, take, for example, return on equity and return on asset. Okay. Return on equity, return on asset. Return on equity just measures the equity version, just the equity part. So it will tell you that this firm is doing well, but on the asset side of the firm, the firm will not be doing well. Partial. Implicitly, they also assume constant returns to scale, which is not real, because some markets deal with you know, variable returns. Now, what do we mean by the assume constant returns? Look at the paper by Ferris et al. Constant returns because if you calculate ratio like three over two, they will tell you that in order to maintain the ratio, do something, if you increase the, the numerator by 10%, you have to increase the denominator by 10%. Oh yes, if you double the input, you will double the output, that's ratios. But that's not always true. Because in real life, you can double the inputs and the output will not double. Because the inputs that came, they will start lazing about. This one will say this one will do, this one will say this one will do, and eventually no output is produced. So there's checking. That, and that makes life not constant, but variable. Third, these ratios don't identify benchmark or role models for inefficient firms. Now, if you tell me that the most efficient firm is DME2, then you are telling me that all the others are what? Inefficient. Now, if the others are inefficient, who are they going to copy? Who are their role models? They can't go and copy DME2, and why? Because the principle is that the DME2 may have a different structure. You can't tell Kokurumanya, secondary school guy, to go and copy um, um, student to, to copy from pre-sex student because that Kokromania guy, the resources at his disposal 
the structures, the technology under which he's operating is different. So there needs to be a benchmark. And also you cannot decompose the performance into several sources. In other words, if we want to know how, where does the 1.5 come from? What is actually driving the 1.5? What are the sources of the efficiency or the sources of the inefficiency? Where is it coming from? You can't tell. And that is why there are problems with the ratios. But of course, there are advantages with ratios. We've already said that they are simple to compute to understand, according to LODA. And also, it can, it can, it can assess a specific aspect of the firm. For example, if you want to assess there's a return and equity, the equity section of the firm, you can just focus on that part and deal with it, even though it does not give the overall measure of the firm. But another disadvantage is that ratios don't incorporate multiple inputs and multiple outputs. This is important because if you look at it, we were just using one input and one output. But life, many firms use multiple inputs and multiple outputs. Take a typical example of a bank. The inputs are quite numerous. Okay? You have deposit, you have financial capital, you have physical capital, you have all of these. So multiple inputs. So how do you consolidate multiple ratios? Somebody will say that then, let's combine this ratio and this ratio together. You can't combine because they are different. So let's plot the data. And one of the things I want you guys to go and do is to plot this data in your own way. So please, I want you guys go home, type this data into Excel and plot it, label it, and come and show me. Plot it. Label it. Now, when you are plotting and labeling, use it, do in this same format. The ability to plot and label will help you master for subsequent times coming. Plot and label. Plot and label. You get it. So plot, scatter plot it. And if you look at it after scatter plot, I have to label it. You label it in the middle. And in this case, I use a regression line to generate a regression line here. So this is a regression line. And in this regression line, you can see that it is a line of best fit. So I've thrown the line. In fact, in Excel, Excel can just draw the regression line for you. But how do you determine efficiency? In this, how do you use the principle of regression to assess efficiency? Well, the distance to the regression line is a measure of efficiency. So the regression line becomes the benchmark. Everybody's distance to the line is determining his efficiency. The closer you are on the line, you are efficient. The further away you are from the line, you are inefficient. The closer you are, you are efficient. The further away you are, you are inefficient. Now that is very, sorry, sorry, it's not the closer you are. However, if you are above the line, you are efficient. If you are below the line, you are inefficient. If you are above the line, you are efficient. If you are below the line, you are inefficient. If you are above the line, you are efficient. You are below, you are inefficient. So which firms are efficient? Which firms? Um, DMU1, DMU two, one, four, DMU2, eight. 4, and 6. Good. So 1, 2, 4, 6. Okay. That is quite strange, eh? That these ones are efficient. But you'd be surprised that regression looks at things for. The regression rather says that if you are above the line, you are over efficient. That's regression. If you are above the line, you are over efficient. And we don't need over efficiency. And if you are below the line, you are completely under efficient. And if you are on the line, you are efficient. See, the problem is that regression has so many issues. Another kind of regression which can be used for this is called stochastic frontier analysis. 
That one, it would determine the, the difference between noise and inefficiency. So let me tell you what that one would do. That one is very scary. Eh? It will tell you that the distance, let's take FEM2. The distance of FEM2 to the line. So this line becomes a stochastic frontier line. I will tell you that the distance between this, which we call the error term, by the way, this error term is split into two. One is a usual error term, which we call noise. And there is another portion of the error term, which you don't see, but according to the stochastic frontier, it is called the inefficiency. So that, that, that thing is saying that further away from the line, you are inefficient. So DMU3 will be having inefficiency and DME2 will also be having inefficiency. And the inefficiency is inside this line and the other part is, is called noise or stochastic error. Again, some people have, you know, they've been using this, but there's a, there's a problem. The problem is that all of them are measuring yourself against the middle. You see the regression line is, is a normal line, it's a, it's a mean. The line is a line of best fit for the mean. So that line is a mean, is the average. And so what it means is that everybody outside the line is comparing himself to the line, to the average. But in life, would you want to compare yourself to the average guy or you want to compare yourself to the best guy? Which one? To the best guy. To the best. Yes, it's the best guy. Because if you compare your, you see, that's why people say all fingers are not equal. I see VS must be shorter. I've heard people say that all fingers are not equal. It is a way yeah. to excuse oneself. It's a way for you not to do things. And so you say all fingers are not equal. Must yours be shorter? Must yours be shorter one? You know, so people use such an excuse to prevent them from actually moving on in life. But this is the way it's supposed to go. It's not supposed to go this way at all. What it's supposed to be is that you rather have to compare yourself to the best. That's all. If you compare yourself to the best, you become among the best. So we need a system to do that. Now, let's look at more problems. And anytime you are trying to justify your use of the DEA, we are going to look at. It's always nice to let the reader know why you chose DEA instead of choosing the SFA, the stochastic analysis. And these are the problems. The stochastic frontier analysis is part of a kind of regressions called parametric regressions. In such parametric regressions, you need one input and many outputs or one output and many input. You know, there is a dependent variable. You remember regression, there's a dependent variable. How many is usually the dependent variable? One, Doc. One. And one. usually, the independent variables are many, isn't it? Yes, Doc. Uh -huh. The dependent variable is one, and usually the independent variables are many. And so if you're, you, are, you are doing cost efficiency, then the dependent variable becomes your cost. It becomes your cost. Okay. This is what they call the total cost. And that means that you have to combine all other costs together. And such combination is not the best. If you are doing not cost, but you are doing technical efficiency, it means that your output must be only one. The output must be just one. But you know that in life, there are multiple outputs. And so that also poses a problem. Unless you use something which is called the stochastic distance function, which is very complex. Lampard and Helges in 2015 have indicated some of the problems associated with parametric regression like stochastic frontier analysis. Another problem with this parametric is that you need to specify a restrictive functional form. Take, take normal regression, for example. One of the functional form we specify is what? 
is a linear regression. But there are so many other kinds of regression. You can have a Cobb Douglas production regression. Have you heard of that? Cobb Douglas production function. Yes, where you have Q equal to AK to the power alpha and then L to the power beta. Now that is not linear, that is quadratic. So you got to log linearize it, which brings about problems. There is another kind of function that you have to specify, like constant elasticity of production function. If you did economics, you know this. Different kinds of functions, quadratic function, Leontief, gamma distribution, and even the inefficiency and then the noise, the error term. Do you remember that in regression, you have to assume that the error term is normally distributed with a zero mean and a constant variable. Do you remember? Then you have to make several other assumptions of heteroscedasticity. Look at the way I'm coughing. Heteroscedasticity, the autocorrelation. And then you fall into the trap of endogeneity, specification errors, and so many things. So because of these complexities of parametric regressions and stochastic analysis, people said enough, enough, okay? And also one other disadvantage of parametric approach is that you do not have the properties of the production function clearly, clearly you know, explained. They are not clearly you know, embedded. For example, the convexity assumption, the free disposability, or the monotonicity assumption, you don't have it there. I will explain all of this as we continue. So the assumptions that, that, that will make the production function a reasonable production function, those assumptions are not there. So because of this, regression will not be ideal for, some people do not want to use regression. Because of this, some people would not prefer to use stochastic front analysis. Is they will prefer to use the third way. And ladies and gentlemen, the third way of assessing efficiency is what is known as data development DEA. Everybody type DEA for me. I want to be sure that you are following me in total, data envelopment analysis, DEA. Type that for me because if you can type that, it means that you are about to learn the interesting technique for estimating efficiency. Now, DEA was propounded by Chance, Cooper, and Rhodes. Chance was a professor, Cooper was a professor, their student was Rhodes. Chance was actually, W.W. Uh, Cooper was actually once upon a time a, a boxer, but he later became a heavyweight in economics and operations research. These people are the brains behind. Of course, they were able to coin the term using some knowledge they have learned from some previous people that we shall also look at. Chance Cooper Rose. So, so, so you can see that we always talk about CCR and CCR refers to the names, the last names of these people. C for Chance, C for Cooper, R for Rose. Chance, Cooper, Rose. So anytime you see CCR, 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 know that it's Chance Cooper Rose, Chance Cooper Rose, Chance Cooper Rose. We shall be representing efficiency by the terminal or by the Greek letter theta. We shall represent efficiency by Greek letter theta. And theta is an important one we shall use to represent efficiency. But of course, we are talking about, in this context, we are talking about input efficiency, input efficiency, input efficiency. So we shall use theta and not some of these points, it's very important. We shall use theta to represent input efficiency and we shall use phi, 
Greek letter phi to represent you know, Greek letter phi. I don't know if you remember Greek letter phi, but let me see if I can just remind you of Greek letter phi. So this Greek letter phi is, is represented by this. So theta is this. That's for input efficiency. And Greek letter phi is given by that. So input efficiency for theta, output efficiency for phi. Okay. Input efficiency for theta, and then output efficiency for phi. Note that now. So these are the terminologies that we are going to be using. Data development and let's define it first. This is probably the best definition you can keep in mind. The keywords in the definition are very important. As we go, you will understand better the keywords. But if you have to memorize it, you want to know that initially. Okay. It is a non-parametric frontier method. That word alone is important. Non-parametric, which means there are no parameters. There are no parameters here means that there are no coefficients. You remember in regression, you have the, the regression parameters. Okay, which are now estimated and converted to coefficient. Uh -huh. This one, there are no parameters where you determine the significance of it as to whether they are within the confidence interval. No. So it's a non-parametric envelopment frontier method. It was developed by the three gentlemen I talked about, Chance, Cooper, and Rose. And later on, when Chance died, another gentleman called Banker came to join them and then we had Chance Cooper, Banker Chance and Cooper. Banker Chance and Cooper. Now, now DEA, the acronym for Data Envelopment Analysis, is a linear programming frontier optimization approach. So that means that you will need to understand a bit of linear programming to appreciate it. And what is linear programming? Maximize a certain objective subject to certain constraint, given some parameters. And all of you may have done or have done linear programming already. So it is a linear programming method. And what it does, and very, very, very important what I'm about to share with you. What it does is that it assesses the relative efficiency of homogeneous DMUs. Let me stop there first. It assesses, that's the word I'm using, instead of using the word it measures, because assesses is more encompassing. It evaluates the relative efficiency. Why relative? Why not it just relate, uh, evaluate the efficiency? No, relative. Because if you estimate the efficiency it is in comparison with something. The efficiency of any particular DMU is in relation to a frontier that you have created. It's related to a frontier. We might talk about production possibility frontier, cost frontier, revenue frontier, profit frontier production front. So it is in relation to a benchmark, a frontier, that you are assessing the efficiency. So the efficiency becomes a relative efficiency measure. And the fans must be homogeneous. We've already emphasized the principle of homogeneity. It must be homogeneous. What does that mean? Well, what it means is that these fans must use similar inputs to produce similar outputs. The input must be multiple inputs, and the output must be multiple outputs, but they must be similar across DMUs. So when you go to this country and that country, you know, everybody must agree that, you know, um, labor is part of the input. And when you go to this, so they must be similar, homogeneous. You can't combine apples and oranges. You can't combine banks and insurance companies because they are not homogeneous. So homogeneity is very essential in doing DEA efficiency analysis. 
again, DEA, this is how the efficiency is done. We look at it deeply, don't worry. Now we use the data I have told you. So that's why I want you to go and then scatter plot the data in Excel. What the DEA will do first is to construct the frontier. The frontier I've told you can be cost frontier, revenue frontier, production frontier, or profit frontier. So DEA will first construct the frontier. Then what? But how does it construct the frontier? Well, it constructs the frontier from the data that you collected. No wonder it's called data envelopment. From the data that you collected, what is the data you collected? The inputs and the outputs you collected is the data. So you may have deposits, loans, um, corporate share responsibility, labor hours, and things like that. All of this are the data. And they make up a particular unit, a particular DMU. So it will construct the frontier using the data. It is data driven. And it does that, it constructs the frontier using the data. So what it means is that if it is constructing the frontier, then there must be some things that are in the data that are helping the frontier to be constructed. And those things are called the best practice DMs. Best practice DM. They are the ones who are the, the green light firms, the super gentlemen and ladies in the industry. They are the ones that will help you construct the frontier. And it does that using something Tamasoli called the minimum extrapolation principle. So this is how DEA, so the first thing DEA will do is to construct the frontier. Then what? And this is it, listen carefully. Then the relative efficiency, in this case, the technical efficiency, because I'm assuming production frontier, the relative technical efficiency of each of the DMU is evaluated or is assessed by the distance of how far that particular DMU is from the constructed frontier. So the frontier will be there but how far you are from the frontier will determine your inefficiency or your efficiency. So first, what the DEA does is to identify the frontier units. Those that are on the frontier, it identifies them as efficient firms. And then those that are not on the frontier, the non-frontier firms, they are identified as inefficient. And this is what it does. This is where it's interesting. It will now assess the efficiency of every one of the firms. Now, if you're already on the frontier, it means that your distance from where you are to the frontier will be zero. So that means that there's no distance between you and the frontier. And so you are efficient. But if you are away from the frontier, the distance you are from the frontier becomes your inefficiency. And so based on that, we can calculate your efficiency. But the fact that you are inefficient, DEA does not stop there. DEA will move ahead and go ahead and try to identify what is making you inefficient. Those firms that are inefficient, we call them dominated units. It will identify what is causing their inefficiency. It will then rank every one of these firms pinpoint improvement target. So you see, you are ranking them, those that are efficient and those that are inefficient. And then it will now identify your target, what you should do to become efficient. And then it will tell management that this is what you got to do to be efficient. So management are able to know their own effectiveness and their performance. Policies can be made, programs can be made, managerial policies can be made. And it is for the industry because industrial policies can also be made. So DEA is a benchmarking exercise. It's a beautiful, beautiful benchmarking. So it's not just theoretical thing. People that have done this course have gone ahead to become consultants. In fact, there have been a number of consultancies that have been done in many papers 
you know, for government and for institutions just using DU. It's been used to save a lot of income okay, for so many organizations. So let's go back to our data, the data that we have. In fact, that's what we are going to do next time, actually, given the time. Next time, we are going to use the data that we have, and we are now going to scatter plot the data and then draw the efficiency frontier, calculate the efficiency of every firm in here, and compare it with the ratio analysis and see how DEA outperforms the other methods. And then we can now 